I mean, it's interesting because there, there are a lot of incantations. I mean, the book actually starts with a series of rituals and, and incantations and, uh, and particularly in relation to writing and telling your own story. And one of the things, um, especially the first one that begins how to tell a story is this sort of incantation of how, to, how do you start, how do you write, how do you begin to tell your story? And one of the things I set out to do in that short section was to show that there can be a sort of magic in telling your story, but there also can be a price in it. That these incantations, if, if they hold any power, they're not necessarily uh, benign. Jeff Jackson writes disturbing stories about beautiful characters. His writing is given shape by remnants of dreams and the resonance of found objects. Anything can happen at any time in the tales he tells, and do, to his reader's consternation and delight. He is the author of Mira Corpora, a finalist for the Los Angeles Times Book Prize, and selected one of the best works of fiction in 2013 by Salon, Slate, and numerous other magazines. Dennis Cooper says of Jeff that he is one of the most extraordinarily gifted young writers he has read, and David Gates says he is a fresh and startling voice in contemporary fiction. In 2016, Jeff published Novisad, and Farrar, Strauss, and Giroux is publishing his next novel, Destroy All Monsters. His stories combine fragments of culture into urgent narratives about identity and transformation. I'm Mark Paris, and this is On Life and Meaning. Jeff, in preparing for our conversation, I went to your website, and the name of it is Death of Literature. Hardly the name one would expect from a published novelist, short story writer, and produced playwright whose career is on the rise. Why in the world would you call your website Death of Literature? Well, one of the main reasons is it's really hard to find any website domains with Jeff Jackson. Really frustratingly, impossibly difficult. Even like jeff.jacksonedu, it's taken. So I wanted to come up with sort of a provocative and hopefully memorably named website domain. And that, that was one of the reasons. Um, another reason is sort of playing off the idea that, you know, it, what is sort of the state of literature in our culture today? And is it sort of dying out? Uh, I do think that literature, the state of literature has been bemoaned throughout the ages, and actually the idea that literature might be dying out is not a new idea. This goes back probably to the 1800s, that the state of literature is perpetually unhealthy. Um, and in fact, sort of the bigger question today isn't like, is literature dying, but is reading dying? What are your thoughts about what is being read in the marketplace today? Well, it's, it's various. I mean, one of the things that is encouraging is something like the fact that George Saunders' new novel, Lincoln and the Bardo, is a number one bestseller for a really long time. That's a really challenging experimental book, the sort of book that publishers would normally say, oh, the, the reading public, is this is too sophisticated for the reading public. People can't handle this. And in fact, if anyone other than a bestselling author uh, like George Saunders had written it, it would be out on a very small press. Mm -hmm. And so it's encouraging to see that readers have really flocked to that novel and have really engaged really deeply with it. And it's encouraging that I think the reading public is more adventurous than sort of a lot of publishers give them credit for. Um, well, your work certainly is adventurous and requires much of the reader in many respects. How would you describe the category or genre of your novels? Well, I mean, I think Mira Corpora was described as sort of a coming-of-age story for people who hate coming-of-age stories. Um, Novi Sad has been described as sort of apocalyptic fiction dealing with the end of the world. My new book, Destroy All Monsters, is sort of my attempt to imagine like the last rock and roll novel. So I think they're, they're sort of playing off of different uh, sort of different genres and different tropes. Um, but they are hopefully also like really engaged with literature as well and engaged with a lot of the a lot of the great fiction that's come before it. In the broad categories of popular fiction versus literary fiction, um, which side of that divide would you say your work is in? Well, I mean, I'd like to have as many readers as popular as possible. So, like, I'd love for it to be considered. 
I'd love for the marketplace to consider it popular and like let me take care of the literary values. Like that, that's totally fine. <laughs> it's totally fine by me. I mean, I do think there's like a third category in there, which is literature itself. I mean, there's sort of literary fiction, which is fiction that has sort of the patina of being literature without actually being literature, that it's still, in fact, just sort of better written popular fiction. Um, and that's something I'd like to avoid. I'd like, hopefully, that the writing goes deeper than that and asks, like you said, a little bit more, a little bit more involvement and partnership from the reader. So, in your mind, what makes any work literary? I think one of the main things is ambiguity. I think it's about uh, not about leaving something unresolved and about asking the reader to come in and complete the work. That I think there's a lot of fiction uh, today that does a lot of hand-holding for the reader and that sort of lets the sort of emotionally stage manages or stage manages the emotions of the readers and lets you know what you should be feeling, what you should be thinking sort of at every point um, in the story. And I think that literature allows more space for the reader to have their own reactions and to sort of navigate the text however they want to navigate it. I suppose one could say that about any high art, whether sure. that's film or whether it's visual art, uh, the engagement with ambiguity with the audience uh, is something that elevates the work beyond simply uh, pablum. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. It's something that makes it hopefully more memorable, that experience that you have to engage with it. So the title of your first novel, Mira Corpora, I, give it, I gave it a bit of a translation, and it translates from the Latin to mean wonderful bodies. Is it about wonderful bodies? It's apparently also, um, it's an idiomatic Latin expression that means strange and unusual bodies also. Um, it's, one of the reasons I chose the title is that um, the book has so many different parts to it. Um, there are about seven different sections to the book, and each one has sort of a different flavor. And I was really careful about not wanting a title that sort of put undue emphasis on any one of the parts. So I wanted a title that was a little bit more neutral, at almost a title that instead of stamping meaning onto the book before you read it, that the book itself would stamp meaning onto the title, if that makes sense. And so one of the things I liked about Mira Corpora, other than sort of I like the Latin phrase, but I also like the idea that Mira, M-I-R-A, sort of sounds like mirror, but also sort of sounds like the Spanish like to look at. Um, and corpora, I thought, was easy for people to get to corporeal and bodies. And so I thought it had, like, even if you didn't know the Latin or anything like that, it still had a nice poetic resonance. Uh, the notion of strange and unusual bodies certainly can refer to the characters themselves, but in some ways it refers to the actual structure of the novel, that the novel has its own set of bodies, chapter to cha the, the chapter as bodies. Yeah, no, I think that's absolutely right. I think that's, uh, that's an excellent point. Um, there's definitely a lot about bodies in the chapters, and there's sort of the idea almost of the text as this sort of found object, this almost sort of body that's being dissected as you're, as you're reading it. Um, and there's definitely, for me, it was really important that the book, this story was very visceral and very you know, connected to sort of um, bodies and sort of immediate physical sensations. How would you describe the story, a, a summary of it? Um, <laughs> that's, a good, that's a good question also, and I should have a better answer after so many years from the book. It's, it's partly the story of someone who is running away from an abusive situation and sort of moves through a number of different communities on his way to trying to find something that approximates home. Uh, and it's also about someone telling their own story and how that story gets told. Um, and you follow the character from about age six to about age 18. You follow them through sort of colonies of feral children, visiting teenage oracles, being obsessed with reclusive underground rock stars, falling prey to predatory adults, um, coming into strange inheritances. So it's a there's a lot of different sort of situations that the character goes through. So strange and unusual bodies indeed. Yeah. Yeah. 
So uh, chapter one begins with a quote uh, before you get into the actual text. It says, we never have to stretch our imaginations. It is our own lives we can't believe. Is there an element to your own life that you can't believe? Well, one of the things that was playing off of is one of the inspirations for Miracorpora was finding, I had kept these notebooks growing up um, that were, they, were, they weren't journals exactly. Some of them had sort of journal entries. Some of them were notes that I had jotted down. Some of them were fantasies. Some of them were sort of urban legends that I had heard about. Some of them were notes and things that had happened to other people that I knew. And I sort of carried them around with me for years and not really looked at them. And I looked at them, you know, 15 years later, 20 years later, and they seemed like they were written by another person. And so that sort of became some of the source material for Miracorpora. And so I really did feel like, who was this person who wrote these? And what, you know, what were they thinking? I think there is an element sometimes to our lives when we look back on them that is slightly unbelievable or at least who that person was all those years ago is sometimes a little bit out of our reach. There's something about found objects and artifacts that intrigue you. Yes, I'm, I'm very interested in how many different meanings and contexts can be wrenched out of sort of everyday objects or found objects. So, in, ad in addition to your writing, uh, you have done some artistic work working with found objects. Yeah, no, I'm very interested in, uh, when I had a residency at the Goodyear Art Center um, in, the, in the fall, I used a lot of that time to sort of collect and amass these found objects and make these sort of found, uh, found object assemblages, sculptures. And one of the things, one of the rules I set for myself was not having my own hand in it and not creating anything, trying to create something just out of these found objects and how I could arrange them in certain ways so that they would have some meaning. In some ways, that's the work that you're doing with your own journals, isn't it? You are uh, arranging uh, ideas that you once wrote in new ways uh, to contemporarily express something today. Yeah, that's true. I, I definitely more aggressively sort of rewriting over them. I'd say using them more as like a springboard than for the um, for the actual sort of assemblage sculptures. But yeah, absolutely. It definitely started with that idea. Sometimes I think there's so many stories already out there that we work too hard. <laughs> to, uh, um, that There's so much creativity all around us already. Yeah. It's just waiting to be uh, contextualized. So the name of the protagonist is Jeff Jackson, which of course is your name. Is that a matter of you existing in a work of fiction or the fictional character existing in you? Probably a little bit of both. It's, it was interesting because in writing Miracorpora, there are many, many drafts and many versions of the book. And the decision to give the character my name actually came quite late in the process. And I think a lot of people when they read it probably assume that was one of the very first things that I did is, you know, oh, the character's named Jeff Jackson. I'm going to tell my story through this character. And it was really the opposite. The character had had a different name. And it was toward the end of the book that I realized that, well, one, the character had sort of earned the right to my name. I sort of felt like we were, he had, I felt an emotional connection to him, even though we hadn't necessarily gone through all the same things. And also, naming the, giving the character my name charged the book in a certain way, it sort of put a certain electricity through the loop and structure of the book that was important, because the book is about storytelling, and I felt like it was important to implicate myself and sort of honor the initial impulse of using those early journals. Once you gave the character your name, did you relate to the character differently? It was so late in the process that it took me a little while to, it made revising a little bit harder because I was, I was thinking about the character a little bit differently. Um, I, think if I, had, I think if I had done it earlier in the process, it might have created more problems for me. It happened so late in the process that um, it, was, it, it, was less of a, it was less of an issue. Mm -hmm. There's a character in the book who's quite disturbing. His name is Gert Jan. Who is he? He's a very disturbing uh, predatory adult who finds, the, who finds the Jeff Jackson character and basically, uh, basically sort of enslaves him. Um, he's a very, very dark, a very dark character, a very 
abusive character, but a very a person who's very suave in their abuse, and someone who's very calculating and sort of knows when to be tender and gentle, when to be harsh, knows sort of is very good at reading people's weaknesses and exploiting them. Um, I've definitely run into a number of those characters over the years, and this is sort of a you know, an amped up amalgamation of many different unsavory people I've been fortunate enough to uh, not spend too much time with. So Don DeLillo says of your novel, Mira Corpora is at the same time a pure story and a panhandler's fever dream. It's fine work and it's manic pacing and it's summoning of certain cultural elements. How do you summon culture? I'm not sure. I think what DeLillo is referring to there is the use of um, the first thing that DeLillo read from the book was uh, the chapter that's about this underground rock star, Kin Mersey. And so I think DeLillo there is specifically referring to this sort of cassette tape is used as this sort of totem, is passed around between these kids, the tapes of uh, Kin's songs. And there's also this graffiti that is, uh, that's in the city that has taken on sort of various meanings for various people. Mm -hmm. And I think DeLillo's interested in um, taking things that have a certain cultural value and sort of charging them in different ways and seeing if you can get new meanings out of them. So I think the cultural emblems are almost like the way that certain things like graffiti and cassette tapes take on an almost sort of like totemic value for the characters. I think... So in that sense, the way it happens is the characters are so invested in this music and so invested in the mystery of what this graffiti might mean that that's how, it, that's how they summon culture, is through their own uh, transmission of their desires into these objects. You know, the phrase summoning of culture is such a um, evocative phrase in some ways. Is there a magic, an incantation that is part of the process of writing? Maybe when it's working. Um, I mean, it's interesting because there, there are a lot of incantations. I mean, the book actually starts with a series of rituals and, and incantations and, uh, and particularly in relation to writing and telling your own story. Mm -hmm. And one of the things, um, especially the first one that begins how to tell a story is this sort of incantation of how, to, how do you start, how do you write, how do you begin to tell your story? And one of the things I set out to do in that short section was to show that there can be a sort of magic in telling your story, but there also can be a price in it. That these incantations, if, if they hold any power, they're not necessarily uh, benign. That there's, there's a cost to be held for this. There's a great story um, by this writer, Harry Cruz. He talks about this book he wrote called Childhood, The History of a Place. And he wanted, uh, he said he'd been sort of plagued by his childhood demons for years. And he wanted to, to get down that period in, the, in the, the most stark prose he could to sort of purge himself from it. And he thought that this would be a way to sort of get rid of these demons he'd been living with. But in fact, what happened, he said, is that it's almost like he tattooed that experience on his skin and it actually was worse. So if there is a magic in the process of writing, it very well may be a dark magic. Well, I think it can be, I think like any magic, it's potentially dark and potentially light, but you don't enter into it uh, cavalierly. So DeLillo goes on to say, I hope this book finds the serious readers who are out there waiting for this kind of fiction to hit them in the face. What do you make of that? I love it. Um, when I got that, I, DeLillo had read part of the book and wrote wrote those words to me on a postcard that I got. And um, he's one of my absolutely favorite writers. I had to walk around the block a few times before it even felt real. I think he means that the, that the work has a real sort of impact. One of the things I, I want for all my work, not just for Amira Corpora, is that feeling of like a really good rock and roll song where it sort of, it, it picks you up and almost rushes by faster than you can sort of take it on, but it gives you a feeling in your gut, and it gives you sort of a rush, an adrenaline rush. Um, and maybe the, the only way to fully understand it is to go back and listen to it again or read it again. So I sort of took uh, DeLillo's comment about being hit in the face as sort of the visceral impact that hopefully the book has. Your second novel is entitled Novi Sad, which is the name of a city in Serbia. Your author's note says, quote, 
My dreams keep returning to a city under siege. I can hear the daisy chains of rattling car bombs. I can see the steel bridges under constant shelling. Each night, red flares scorch the sky. Each morning, plumes of white smoke rise from a different neighborhood. It's a landscape I can't seem to shake. End quote. What story does Novi Sad tell? So Novi Sad is a sort of companion volume to Mira Corpora. And it's actually fashioned from pieces that had originally been part of uh, the, uh, an early draft of Mira Corpora that just sort of didn't fit. And it tells the story of a group of friends who are living in this sort of battered city and who believe that the end of the world is coming. And they sort of all gather in this abandoned hotel and wait for the end of the world to come. And it tells the story of what happens when that sort of anticipation of the end, what that sort of does to you, what happens when it isn't fulfilled, and it sort of tells the story of what happens to these friends. It's partially also a story of someone looking back on a different part, on a distant part of their lives, and trying to sort of memorialize some of these friendships and trying to understand these experiences they went through through a slightly different frame of reference, through this world that you quoted at the beginning. Yeah. So every moment in history, uh, as we read back, seems to have a, an apocalyptic element to it. Um, there's almost uh, something always lurking on the horizon in terms of the destruction of the cities and civilizations we're creating. What do you make of that in the human psyche? It's somewhat comforting, given our current state, <laughs> given, our, given where we are currently, to know that people have felt that the world is sort of constantly ending, that this is not a new thing. In the same way I said, like, the idea that literature is sort of constantly dying is not a new idea. That there is something comforting in knowing that it does feel like the world is sort of constantly falling apart at different sort of stages of history, and that it hasn't. Which doesn't mean that we don't need to pay attention, it doesn't mean we don't need to be involved, but that... I think there's an idea that our lifespans are so short and that what we go through, because it's new to us, is new to everyone. And one of the great things about sort of being immersed in history is realizing that that's not true. That, you know, we, we live in this sort of much larger um, continuum and that there's a, lot to, there's a lot to learn from that. When I read your work, Jeff, uh, the narrative is dreamlike. The characters are odd. Something horrible can happen at any moment. Um, Hopefully fair. something beautiful could happen at any yes. moment, too. So your novels have been compared to the works of David Lynch. Fair comparison? Oh, I'm, very, I'm honored by that comparison. Absolutely. That's wonderful. I was just watching the latest episode of Twin Peaks last night, which is the most crazy one hour of television that I think has probably ever been broadcast. It was really extraordinary and baffling in the best way. Um, yeah, I mean, one of the things I really like about David Lynch is that he creates these stories that have dreamlike elements, but still also feel largely recognizable in reality. And I'm interested in something that instead of sort of an either or, it's a dream state or it's real, it's sort of both and. Mm -hmm. It's dreamlike and it has sort of a real tangible, real quality. Would you say that describes your writing? Uh, I hope so. I mean, I think particularly for Mira Corpora and Novi Sad, those are definitely strong mm -hmm. elements. In the new book, Destroy All Monsters, the dream elements, the dreaminess, the dream logic in the story is less so, um, just because that was sort of what the story required. So do your dreams inform your writing? Not directly. There have been some dreams that have sort of worked their way into the fiction, but it's more about rather than the dreams themselves, it's more about getting in more of like almost like a dream state when I'm writing or trying to be in a state where I'm very loose and just sort of receptive while I'm writing. Mm -hmm. I'm really, one of the things I was thinking about a lot when I was writing Mira Corpora was this idea of that state just when you're waking up, when you sort of realize sort of the room, the world around you, but you're also still sort of halfway in your dream, and there's a little bit of dream logic operating, that sort of hypnagogic state. And that was something that I was definitely, that it was that state I was trying to capture more than sort of necessarily channeling dreams directly. What makes a character interesting to you? I think the characters that are interesting to me 
are characters that I don't know a lot about going into. That I know enough to want to follow them, but there's something about how they tick, what they might be doing that I don't really understand, that I want to understand more about. Sometimes for me, um, I'll actually see a character doing something before I understand why they're doing it. So sometimes part of the writing process is actually seeing or imagining these things happening and then backing my way into figuring out like the psychology of it. Like what was that character thinking? What, what was their motivation? Coming of age stories. Is there something weird about it? Well, I mean, there's something, there's something weird. I, I, there's something weird about being young, about moving through the world and not knowing much about it, uh, for sure. And I think there's a certain strangeness to the world that as we get older, we tend to shut off. And I think when we're young, uh, the aperture is wider for what's weird. And I think there's a certain politeness that as adults, we tend to, um, we tend to narrow that aperture and, and, know, you know, and write off some of the weird things or, or, or sort of try and look past them. Mm -hmm. So I think, that's, I think that's definitely like a state of you know, being young and being adolescent. What about coming of age stories interest you? I don't know if there's I don't know if it's coming of age per se, but there is something that's interesting about writing about teenagers and young adults. I think because there's so much in flux and everything in their life is in transition. And a lot of their ideas about who they are, their identities are in flux. And a lot of the ways that they deal with situations can be um, are, are very sort of permeable and changeable. I think it's, a, it's an interesting, for me, it's an interesting, um, interesting place to explore a character because they're characters who can really go almost anywhere. I'm, I'm most interested when I'm trying to write in sort of creating almost sort of like an open text, an open playing field where the characters could go any number of places and surprise me at any moment. And sort of younger characters are sort of more apt to do that. What role does violence play in your work? Um, I mean, I think partially is sort of a reflection of where we are right now. You know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of violence around us, both sort of in the media, through the mass shootings, through the way things are reported. Um, so I think the writing is just sort of, uh, is partially just sort of reflecting, reflecting that. Yeah. I mean, I wouldn't say I'm particularly drawn to violence, but I wouldn't say I'm particularly repelled by it either. So I, I just say it's another, it's, it's another element floating through the work. So your next novel is entitled Destroy All Monsters. What can you tell us? So speaking of violence, it is a book about, <laughs> it's sort of my attempt to imagine the last rock and roll novel. Sort of imagining like what is sort of the rock and roll novel where like nothing comes after that. Uh, and one of the things, you know, I, I, my notes for it go back about 10 years and especially this is when a lot of the school shootings were happening and it was really sort of alarming and dismaying. I started to think about like what if there were different, if these weren't happening in schools or before they've been happening in post offices, you know, what if they were happening in some other area? And I started to think about what if they were happening in these small clubs and what if it was bands who were being shot? And, you know, one of the things that, some, one of the things that can inspire me is actually what are things that make me afraid? Um, and so I, I, I really love music, and it's really been really important to, for me. And so I started to think about this idea of these clubs, which for me is a very safe and really enjoyable space. What if they became? What if these became dangerous charged spaces? And what if you never knew when you were going to a club if violence might erupt there? And what if it became dangerous for the bands themselves performing? What would the fallout from that be? So Destroy All Monsters starts with this epidemic of shootings happening at small clubs around the country. And it's, it's not just one person doing this. It's happening. It's like it's a bunch of copycat killings happening. And it's, um, and it's bands on stage that are, being, that are being shot. And the book, that's sort of how the book opens. And then it lands in one town where this has happened. And it's been, the rest of the book stays in this one town dealing with the aftermath of one of these shootings with this community of people. Sometimes real events catches up with writing, doesn't it? It's frightening when that happens, when you think that your imagination is far beyond what reality can bring. And if anything, the past couple of years has shown us is that it's almost impossible to outpace reality. On a personal note, Jeff, what compels you to write? Well, one of, um, 
one of the things I mentioned is that this idea of writing things that scare me entering into sort of unknown spaces in terms of the writing and wanting to explore them. Um, with Mira Corpora, it was really almost wanting to explore this unknown person who had written these, uh, you know, who had written these notebooks and who that was. But um, so it, it's it's a number it's a number of different things. Mm -hmm. I mean, sometimes it can sometimes it starts you know an image that I can't shake. Sometimes it's a it's a sentence that I can't shake. I mean, there's a part of Mira Corpora that was generated simply by two sentences. Um, which were um, ignore the dead body on the floor. It's just earning a living. And I wrote those sentences, and I don't know where they came from, and I literally just sort of followed a story from them. Is there a, an idea, um, a philosophy, that you would want your work to express to the world? I think one of the things I hope it expresses is that well i mean i guess it's a it's a really it's a really good question one of the things i'd like the work to do is to be sure that it's something that asks for engagement from from a reader that it asks for you to invest some of yourself in doing that i think that there's something about work there's something about literature that asks you to actively participate that is really, uh, there's really less and less of that in our culture. And I really do feel like even politically, like it's an important act that you're, that not only are you showing uh, a certain respect to the reader, but you're also, you're also engaging the reader in the pleasure of sort of navigating and interpreting a text for themselves. Like it's not, to me, like literature isn't about like, oh, it's good for you and you should do it because it's like eating your vegetables. It's because at the highest level, it's more pleasurable than beach reads. It gives you something that's more lasting and more fun and enjoyable. Thank you, Jeff. It's great to have you here today. Oh, my pleasure. Jeff Jackson is the author of the novels Mira Corpora and Novi Sad, and the soon-to-be-published Destroy All Monsters. His fiction has been featured in Guernica, Vice, and The Common. He has written plays performed in New York, edited literary anthologies, co-founded a popular website on jazz, and received fellowships from several leading centers of art. He received his MFA from NYU. And now a personal word. The dark coming-of-age stories that Jeff writes about reminds me that we are always emerging. Our cells are replicating, our bodies are adapting, nature is selecting. I once wrote, we live in this interregnum in history, this period between text and screen. We are in the final days of manipulated words, chapters, indices, and endnotes, and rushing headlong into a ubiquity of pixels and visual vocabulary. We are birthing a touchscreen world, where every surface will be animated with electronic images, subject to our fingertips as we pull and squeeze and stretch whatever our minds can map into weather reports. We are all creators now, Adam and God on the Sistine Chapel in their dance of will, forming the universe with all that Genesis promises and warns. Jeff's novels are prophetic warnings of cities on the edge of destruction, of music that redeems of dreams and nightmares and alternative endings. We are always forming ourselves. We are always coming of age. I'm Mark Paris, and you've been listening to On Life and Meaning. Thank you to my amazing partners, Andy Goh, producer of the show, and to Chris Curriton, art and media director. We are supported by friends and listeners to this podcast please visit us at onlifeandmeaning.com and become a patron of the show. Thank you for listening.